Thank you, Dr. Williams, for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to speak at this symposium. Um, Dr. Williams gave me some request about what I should talk. It's an overview about nanomedicine, uh, especially nanotechnology in drug delivery and so on. So today I designed my talk in two parts. So I will start from an overview of nanomedicine, including the evolution and its impacts on current healthcare. Then I will use my own research at UC San Diego as examples to further describe what nanomedicine is and my personal understanding about nanomedicine and drug delivery. So let me start my lecture from this cartoon about ourselves. As you know, it took us humankind millions of years to evolve from the left side to the right side. During this long journey, we were not lonely. We were accompanied by an inseparable partner called disease. So as brought up by Dr. Robert Freitas in his book titled Nanomedicine. So the history of disease is vastly older than that of uh, humankind itself. Indeed, disease and uh, parasitism have been inseparable companions of life since the dawn of life on the earth. Well, this statement is strongly supported by what have been discovered by archaeologists and anatomists from fossil. So there is a very strong evidence showing that bacteria similar to those responsible for many infections that afflict, afflict people today um, existed on Earth about 500 million years ago. And also, uh, the body chemistry disorders due to the malnutrition, these things happened, occurred about 1.75 million years ago already. Regarding cancer, an archaeologist find that about half a million years ago, the bone cancer had a morbid growth on Java man's framework. So all these diseases, you can find it many, many years ago. Now, towards nowadays, with going of the advancement of the diagnostic tools and equipment, more and more diseases have been disclosed. And according to the very recent statistics from the National Center of Health Statistics, you can find that in the United States, in 2009, the death number is about 2.4 million. And about these numbers, we know the first killer, number one killer, is heart disease in this country. So it's almost, uh, it's near like uh, 600,000 deaths because of heart disease. And it's a second by, then followed by cancer. It's about 568,000 um, deaths and all other diseases, st stroke, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and this list is too long to list. So this is a brief review of the history of disease. Now, I also want to give a brief review of the history of scientific medicine. Frankly speaking, and the scientific medicine scientific only occurred about 150 years ago. In the past 5,000 years, patients are mainly treated based on empirical methods, that's based on religious habits, natural phenomena, and some observational, um, observational uh, results and so on, and the religious authorities and so on. Until 1850, at that time, and the um, rationale scientific medicine occurred. At this time, patients were diagnosed with uh, um, proper tools and then treated with appropriate drugs, although the drug was not advanced at that stage yet. But in the, um, about 1950, 1940 to 1950, the molecular level drug occurred. And at that time, now the much more advanced the molecular scientific medicine was used to treat a variety of different diseases. And it was predicted that nanomedicine may occur by 2010. 2010, this is about the nanomedicine. But since the scientific scientists and pharmaceutical researchers worked harder and faster than what they were expected, the first nanomedicine was approved by FDA in 1995. It's about 15 years earlier. So it's a liposomal formulation of Dr. Rubinson. So this is an anti-cancer drug. It's widely used to treat many types of cancer, but it has associated with very strong side effects. So scientists load them into a small lipid vesicle. The size is about 130 nanometer, and it significantly improved the therapeutic efficacy. And nowadays, it's routinely prescribed to treat a variety of cancers in all the hospital. So this is a 
about the first drug of uh, nanomedicine. Now, now, what is exactly, what is uh, nanomedicine? Well, nanomedicine is considered as a branch of medicine a branch of medicine that concerns with the application of nanotechnology to the prevention and the treatment of disease. It involves the monitoring, repair, construction, and control of human biological systems at the molecular level using engineered nano device and nanostructures. So basically, it's the application of nanotechnology in medicine. We call it nanomedicine. And regarding nanotechnology, so based on the definition from the National Nanotechnology Initiative, nanotechnology is the understanding and the control of matter at the dimension between approximately one to 100 nanometer scale. Now, it, uh, at this scale, the nanotechnology involves the imaging, measuring, modeling, and manipulating matter at this length scale. So we are working at this length scale of the matter and try to improve the current medicine. So these pictures may give you a better understanding about this length scale. So you can see if you divide the total length of the Indiana, Indianapolis motor speedway by uh, one million, that is about the length scale of ants. Now for the length scale of the ants divided by another one million, so this is the length scale we are working on. It's a typical size of a quantum dust, a small gold nanoparticle, which is about a four nanometer. And also for the Single wall carbon nanotube, it's about one nanometer. This is the diameter. So this is typically about 10 billion times smaller than the regular width of a house, say 10 meters. So now the question is, why do we need to go to nano? At such a nano, at nanometer scale, um, which kind of advantages we can achieve? Well, at this length of scale, material, materials have very unique physical chemical properties, such as ultra small size, large surface area, and mass, uh, surface area ratio uh, to mass, and the high reactivity, and so on. So these properties can be used to overcome some of the limitations that exist for the traditional therapeutic agents and the diagnostic materials, and so on. So that's why we're interested in this uh, uh, length of scale. Now, although this uh, first drug, as I said, was approved in 1995, but the concept of nanomedicine has been brought up many, many years before that. So the first uh, um, on record proposal about nanomedicine was uh, written by uh, Professor Richard Feynman, 1959. So this is the first knowing proposal. It's a very wild idea. So in the proposal, he said, well, this is a very wild idea, but it would be interesting to, to do the surgery if you, if you can swallow a surgeon into the body and this surgeon can swim to the place, look around to find which valve of the heart is wrong and it took a little knife and cut it and then repair it. That's the basic idea of this proposal. Of course, it was not funded. And <laughs> then, but you know, uh, Dr. Feynman got this Nobel Prize in physics in 1965. If that proposal was funded, maybe he couldn't get this physics Nobel Prize in quantum electrodynamics. So then uh, it's followed by the other one is a fantastic voyage. This is familiar to many people. So this was later translated to a very cool movie. And a lot of people may read this. So you have this submarine going to the body and then to do the surgery. So it's called Fantastic voyage, it's, it's uh, difficult to reach at that time, but uh, re recently there's a very uh, significant and uh, advanced research on the nano machine and the nano motor field has, uh, I would say, made a very significant step towards this goal, especially now, the, probably you know, the UCSD research group led by Professor Joe Wang here has developed the fastest nano motor in the world. So this nanomotor has a very strong tolling force, and it recently developed the fuel-free nanomotor without any fuel. It's controlled by external magnetic field. So it's a significant step towards the in vivo application. I'm pretty sure Dr. Wang will give you more details in the next lecture. But at 1966, that is uh, uh, it's a dream to all the people. Now, in 1986, the first technical paper on this uh, cell repair machine or nano machine uh, was written by Erica Drexler. 
So this is, a, this is an interesting story because this is an invited paper by the editor of the journal. Usually you got an invitation from the journal your paper was published, but this paper was rejected by the reviewer because the comment is a scientific journal doesn't publish science fiction. So his paper was rejected, but at that time you can see it's very difficult to convince people about this nanotech in the field of medicine or healthcare. Until 1990s, the nanoscale material technology has found a very wide use in medicine because of all these uh, biocompatible materials and some analytic, analytical techniques, surgical and dental practice, and nerve cells research using the um, intracellular electrodes and so on, and vaccine design, and all this research has pushed people towards the nanomedicine era. So nowadays, there are, nowadays there are various nanomedicine products that have been approved. So it's not a dream anymore. And according to some statistics in, 19, in 2008, there are about 38 nanomedicine products that have been approved and used in clinic. And in this review article uh, by myself, I systematically reviewed all these 24 nanoparticle-based drug delivery systems that have been FDA approved and used to treat a variety of cancers and other diseases. So you can see they are polymer, lipid-based, polymer-based, and four of other nanostructure-based drug delivery systems. So this is about the um, the current status of nanomedicine, of course, there are hundreds of these nanotech drugs that are currently in the pipeline for preclinical or clinical tests. So this uh, summarizes the concept of nanomedicine. You know, nanomedicine is a very broad research topic now, but you can divide them to divide it to about typically six categories. The first one, drug delivery and the drug therapies. So basically this means you make the drug itself as a nanostructure, and in vivo imaging, in vitro diagnostics, you use nanotech to, you collect the blood, you quickly diagnose what is the biomarkers inside, what's the concentration, and so on. For in vitro diagnostics, active implants, this is typically for the stent, how to improve the kernel stent technique and make them a non-folding surface, and then biomaterial, the overall field of biomaterials. Now for this, then based on a recent uh, statistical results, you find that in the field of nanomedicine now, about 70% of the scientific publications about drug delivery. And in the United States, the US patents, 60% of the patents on nanomedicine is about drug delivery. So you can see drug delivery is currently the dominant field. Um, well, the drug delivery, of course, is also related to some other fields, but this is just the leading research topic on nanomedicine nowadays. So in the remaining parts, I want to give you more uh, detailed explanation of nanotechnology drug delivery. So I would rather to use my own research to give you a few examples of what nanotech drug delivery is and how it works. So this slide briefly summarizes the research currently ongoing in my research lab. So my research group is interested in um, overall is nanomedicine and nanomaterials, but it includes a few uh, sub-directions. One is to develop a new drug delivery platform. So we have tried to develop these nanoparticles with a size below 100 nanometer with very unique features for systemic or topical or other drug delivery applications. And then for the cancer parts, we are particularly interested in combinatorial drug delivery, because we think a single drug might not be enough to cure the cancer. So you have to simultaneously administer two or more types of drugs and try to generate synergistic effects. So our goal is to use one delivery vehicle to simultaneously deliver multiple dr different drugs to the same cancer. Now these drugs will target the different pathways of the cancer try to reduce the cancer drug resistance. And the other direction is about antimicrobial drug delivery. So here we are particularly interested in some tough bacteria such as Staphylococcus, And this bacteria, you know, it caused many deaths and it's very difficult to treat. We want to develop a nanotech system that can directly deliver antibiotics or antimicrobials to the particular bacteria and lyses the bacteria and cure them without generating any resistance. 
And the other direction is about a fundamental science. We are interested in uh, understanding exactly what's going on here, how these nanoparticles interact with the biological membranes, such as the cancer membrane, bacteria membrane, how these particles are internalized by the cell, and how do they escape from the endosome to show the activity. It's about a fundamental science. Because of the time issue, so today I will just give you two examples. The first one is to give a, a to share with you a recent biomimetic nanoparticle platform that we have developed. So we call this a red blood cell membrane camouflaged biomimetic nanoparticle. And the other, you can see this particle, the core is a synthetic core, but the surface, the shell, is a natural native um, red blood cell membrane. And the other part is to do nanoparticle assisted combinatorial drug delivery. So, since the focus is about drug delivery, I would like to use one slide to summarize the key concept of nanoparticle drug delivery. So drug delivery means you use nanoscale particles or molecules developed to improve the bioavailability, pharmacokinetics, and efficacy of uh, therapeutics. But this cartoon really give us a very good summary about what nanoparticle drug delivery is. So this is a blood vessel. And there is an ugly cell here, so this is a diseased cell, say cancer cell. And then you have the bloodstream. This is a typical nanoparticle, and this nanoparticle has a core shell structure. You can see this is a hydrophobic core. You can load hundreds and thousands of the drug molecules inside. It's protected by a hydrophilic shell to prolong uh, the circulation lifetime and to protect the hydrophobic core. And on top of this shell, you have some kind of ligands. We call it targeting ligands. And these ligands can recognize the cancer-specific antigen that is overexpressed by the cancer cell. So when these particles circulate in the bloodstream, when they find the cancer cell or target cell, they bind to the cell and trigger the endocytosis. When the particles are internalized by the cell, now it can release all the cargo in a controlled and a sustained manner or in a burst manner. But all the drug will release inside the cell, aiming to kill the cell quickly. So this overall, for the nanoparticle drug delivery, it has many advantages. The first one is to prolong drug systemic circulation half-life. If you have experience or know about this, uh, like the chemotherapy drug, these are typically small molecules with a molecular weight less than 500 Dalton. For such a small molecule, it can penetrate through any tissue in the body. That's why when you do one injection to the blood, it lasts in the blood for only five to 10 minutes. And then it spreads to the whole body, from the hair to the foot. So in other words, after these five or 10 minutes, there's no drug in the bloodstream. They all go to the place that it shouldn't go. So now if you load them into the nanoparticle, so this nanoparticle is much larger than the drug molecule. It's about uh, less than 100 nanometer. So they will be confined in the bloodstream. They can circulate much longer. It can be prolonged from a few minutes to a few hours and even a few days for the circulation half-life. And also targeted delivery can reduce the harmful side effects, this is very easy to understand. Because now if these particles can recognize the diseased cells, it will go specifically to that cell and reduce the non-specific side effects. And a sustained and a controlled drug release. If you load this drug into the particle here, when the particle circulate in the bloodstream, if it's targeted, it can target the cell and go inside and then release the drug. You can control that or even for regular disease. Now, when the particles circulate in the bloodstream, it goes through diffusion. All the small molecule drug can slowly diffuse through the particle and go to the bloodstream. So this way, you can maintain the uh, drug concentration within the therapeutic window for a long time. And also facilitate administration by improving drug solubility. So this is also very important because now a lot of drugs, chemotherapy drugs, or the drugs we use are hydrophobic. In other words, they are not water soluble. You cannot use them directly. Especially now, nowadays, there are some research, uh, quite interesting research I'm going about called marine drug. So these are the drugs that are collected from the uh, marine organisms. They shoot very toxic activities against the cancer cell. Even on the nanomore scale, it can kill the cancer. But the problem is that these drugs are absolutely not soluble. You cannot use them directly. So this way, you have to load them into some kind of delivery vehicle, for example, a nanoparticle. 
a polymeric nanoparticle, then you can solubilize them in the hydrophobic polymeric core to make these drugs useful. And lastly, it can improve the patient's compliance due to less invasive dosing. This is very obvious. Because currently for the chemotherapy, in order, because the drug will last in bloodstream so shortly, the only way you can solve that, you, can, you need to continuously perfuse the drug to the blood vessel. So typically, one cycle of the chemotherapy now is about uh, three to five hours. The patients need to lie there and have 500 cc blood continuously flow into the blood vessel. This way you maintain the drug concentration in the blood window. But if you have a good nanoparticle de nanomedicine, nanoparticle delivery system, maybe you can do just one single injection and let the particles circulate in the bloodstream and continuously release the drug. So it will significantly benefit the patients. Now, as I mentioned, the application of this nanotechnology to drug delivery has already had a very significant impact to many areas of medicine, cancer therapy, heart disease, vaccination, and um, eye disease, and so on. So currently, there at least, because that is the result is about in 2008. So at least 24 nanoparticle therapeutics that have been approved for clinical use, and they have demonstrated the advantages of nanotech versus the free drug molecule. It improved the therapeutic index of the drugs that are carried by the nanoparticle. And meanwhile, the numerous other nanoparticle platforms are currently in various stages of clinical and preclinical pre tests. Now, regarding these nanotech drug delivery platforms, uh, you can see the typical systems include libosum. This is a lipid vesicle. You can see that this system has a, a lipid layer and it has an aqueous core. You can load the hydrophilic drug inside. And then the second one is about a polymeric nanoparticle. This is a solid particle. It's a core shear structure. It has a, a hydrophobic polymeric core. You can load the small molecule hydrophobic drugs inside with high loading. And you have a hydrophilic shear to prolong their circulation in the bloodstream. And the polymer drug conjugates. So this is a relatively simpler. You basically conjugate the drug molecule to a large polymer. So this way, you can prolong their lifetime in the bloodstream. And a dendrimer. For the dendrimer, it, has, it can uh, deliver both hydrophilic and hydrophobic drugs. Because some of the hydrophobic dendrimer has the hydrophobic cavity that you can load the uh, hydrophobic drugs. And you can attach the hydrophilic drugs onto the surface. And some other protein-based nanoparticle systems, such as albumin, and also other nanoparticle systems include the metallic nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle, iron oxides, and ceramic nanoparticles, such as silica nanoparticle, porous silica particularly, and so on. So for all these uh, uh, particle systems, when you use them for systemic drug delivery, for topical or oral drug delivery, the stories are different. But for systemic delivery, when you inject them into the bloodstream, the key challenge is their um, in vivo stability, in other words, circulation lifetime. Because uh, there are millions of virus of bacteria get into our body every day, but they were cleaned by our immune system. So when you inject this particle to the body, to the bloodstream, these particles are at the similar size as virus, it's considered as a foreign material. Your immune system will work crazily to clean them up. So that's why how to um, prolong the circulation is on because the immune system clears, clears all the foreign nanoparticles from the body quickly. If you do not do anything, these particles will stay in the blood for just minutes. Now, the current state of art is to coat this nanoparticle with a hydrophilic polymer, such as a polyethylene glycol. So you can see the, uh, poly this hydrophilic coating, like here, it forms the hydration layer. Now, because of the entropy effect, when all these plasma proteins try to absorb onto the surface, they cannot. They'll be kicked off. So this hydration layer can hide the core, the nanoparticle, from the immune system. This is uh, for all the current currently approved nanoparticle system is based on this technique. Now for our research, we want to see, well, instead of hiding the nanoparticle from the immune system, can we disguise the nanoparticle as part of the body itself? So in this way, we do not need to hide. So we just make this nanoparticle, we camouflage them as a part of the body. So this is our initial motivation. And this work was triggered by the knowledge on red blood cell. 
So you know the red blood cell in the body can last very long. They can go up to 180 days. So why these red blood cells can, or the human body's cell can stay so long? Uh, because these cells have specific antigen called self markers on the surface. So they have this antigen on the surface. When the immune cells or proteins approach them, it can give the signal that this is the part of the body, do not touch it. So this is called a self marker. So there's a, a quite quite a lot of research try to identify this self marker. For example, one is called a CD47. So this antigen on the cell surface, people try to get this CD47 or synthesize them and attach them to the nanoparticle surface. Indeed, it can fool the macrophage and prolong the circulation half-life. But our understanding is for the cell, it's quite complicated. It might not be dominated by a single antigen, it might maybe two or three or more. And also it might be a specific a dynamic interaction instead of just you statically conjugate the antigen onto the surface. So here, our idea is how about we collect the whole red blood cell membrane, the whole native red blood cell membrane, and then we use this red blood cell membrane to wrap on the surface of the nanoparticle. So whatever drugs loaded into the particle, we just keep them here, but on the surface, we dress the nanoparticle with a red blood cell membrane clothes. So this way, it looks like a mini red blood cell. So this is the overall idea. And then this is our uh, experiments. So indeed, we collect this RBC from the, um, from the animal, and then we, from the whole blood, and then we use some um, hypotonic treatment of this. You can see for the RBC and the face microscope image, because it contains the hemoglobins inside, it is a bright field here. But once you do the homotonic treatment, you can remove all the core, the stuff inside the RBC. You got just the RBC membrane. And then you get this RBC membrane. And this, is a, this shows our protocol, what exactly what we did. So you have this emptied RBC. It's also called RBC ghost. So the RBC ghost is typically about a two micron. Now we do this uh, extrusion method. We can form some lipid vesicle from the RBC membrane. So this is called the RBC membrane-derived vesicle with a size about 120 nanometer. And also we prepare some nanoparticle, polymeric nanoparticle with a size less than 100 nanometer. And then of course we can load any kind of drug. We have an extensive research experience on loading drug into this polymeric core. Now you have this polymeric core, you mix these two. Because these are the empty vesicles, they have very high surface tension, they are not stable. They love to fuse with some solid substrate. So once you mix these two, and of course you add some external interaction triggers, then this liposome vesicle will fuse onto the surface to form a particle about 80 nanometer. So it has a core of a synthetic polymer, and it has a shell of natural red blood cell membrane. And this is, a, a, this is a, the design and the protocol. Of course, we want to see exactly what's going on. So this is a transmission electron microscope image. You can clearly see all these nanoparticles. The white part is the core, and the dark side is the shell, the lipid membrane that has been negatively stained. So you can see all these particles quite uniformly distributed, and all of them have a surface coated with this membrane. If you room into a single nanoparticle, you can see the shell size is about a six nanometer. That's the characteristic thickness of red blood cell membrane. So indeed, we put this RBC membrane onto the surface, and the core is also similar as the uh, PRJ polymeric core that we have made. So this is a, a direct evidence that we have synthesized these particles. And also, we did this uh, um, cellular uptake experiment, because now you can see this has a core, has a shell. When they interact with the cell, whether these two will still stay together, say whether this lipid shell can be easily peeled off. And then if you have the PRG itself, it has a very, very short circulation lifetime. So if you inject that, it will screw the whole system because the PRG will aggregate quickly. So on one hand, they have very low, uh, very short lifetime. On the other hand, the experimental animal will die because of giant particle in the bloodstream. So here we designed another experiment called co-localization. So we uh, labeled this nanoparticle, 
because it has a core. We labeled the polymeric core with a red fluorescent probe. It's attached to the polymer to trace where the polymer is. And also, we attached the green fluorescent probe to the uh, red blood cell membrane lipids, so we know where the membrane is. Now, you incubate this uh, biomimetic nanoparticle with the cancer cell, so you can clearly see that after they are internalized by the cells, so you can observe the, both the green and the red, and they overlap together. So this clearly demonstrated that these particles stay as a core shell structure, even after they are internalized by the, target, by the cancer cell. And then, of course, we want to test whether this system is stable, how long they can stay in the bloodstream. But before that, we want to prove what is, whether the protein, these key proteins are transferred, translocated from the red blood cell membrane to our red blood cell membrane camouflaged nanoparticle. So this is just, uh, you run through the western blood, go through the gel. So this is the empty RBC. You can see the key proteins here. And this is RBC membrane-derived vesicle. And this is our final biomimetic nanoparticle. So you can clearly see that all the proteins, the, most of these RBC membrane-associated proteins are translocated from the RBC cell to our nanoparticle. With these proteins on the surface, we are confident that they will stay long in the bloodstream. They may have a great uh, circulation lifetime. So the next step is to do the circulation half-life. This is a typical um, study. You have the animals, you do a telvin injection. Before you do that, you attach some probe to your nanoparticle. So you let the nanoparticle circulate in the bloodstream. And then at each time point, you collect some of the blood from the saphenous vein or other veins to collect some blood from the animal just a little bit. And then you analyze how many nanoparticles are remained in the bloodstream. So you plot this one, you will get the signal from with the time, going of time. So here we used our RBC coated nanoparticle, and also the current state of art is a polyethylene glycol coated nanoparticle, and also the other one is just, just a polymeric nanoparticle without any protection. So you can see all the three curves here. So the first one is a RBC membrane camouflaged nanoparticle. This is a, uh, the intensity, this is going with time, and the blue line is about the current state of art. And this uh, dark one is our, black one is our polymeric nanoparticle without any protection. You can clearly see, once you inject it, five minutes later, no signal in the blood, because they're all gone to the blood, and one of the mice died because of the aggregation. So you can clearly see how important this surface layer protection is. Now, there are several models to calculate what is the circulation half-life. So a typical one is called com two-compartment model. You can fit this curve with a two-compartment model, and this slope tells you the circulation half-life, also called elimination half-life. And then from the data, you can see that for this RBC membrane, the elimination half-life is about 39.8, almost 40 hours. That is a half-life means after you do injection, 40 hours later, still 50% of the nanoparticles are available in the system. And for the current state of art, it's about 15.6 hours. So this is a very typical, because currently polymeric nanoparticles, the state of art of circulation half-life is about 10 hours. And we improved that system in our pegylated nanoparticle, so it can go up to 15 hours, that's the best. And the bare PRG nanoparticle, you cannot detect it at all. So this, you can see this system is, when you put this RBC onto the surface, it makes a huge difference. Now this system looks similar as a, um, it has a self markers and a combination of proteins on the surface. So this paper was recently published in a PNAS and it also selected by National Academy of Engineering as this year's engineering innovation. Because this is and broadcast to the public through a WTOP radio station because uh, no such research to combine natural cell membrane with a synthetic material for nanomedicine so far. Okay, so now this is about the first story. Currently we are working a lot, try to uh, do a large scale fabrication. Now we can fabricate a lot of these particles. And we do therapeutic efficacy study. And we also collaborated with a clinician on uh, leukemia treatment, because we thought this would be the best platform to treat leukemia. It's a blood cancer when the nanoparticle continuously circulate in the bloodstream and continuously sustainably to release the chemo drug. It was significantly improve the current leukemia 
standard treatment. Now let me uh, switch the gear to um, another part. This is about the shell. Now I go to the core. So how to load the drug inside. As I mentioned, we're particularly interested in combinatorial treatment. So first of all, why combination therapy is important. So this summarizes the mechanism of the cancer. So you can see for the cancer, it's very notorious for its drug resistance. So you treat the patients with, uh, for example, docetaxel, prostate cancer with docetaxel. It works very well for the first one or two cycles. And three months later, it doesn't work anymore. It's just because of the cancer cells develop a resistance against that particular taxol drug. So because a, a cancer cell can adapt the drug efflux pump, it have this efflux pump. When the drug molecule goes in, it will pump it out. So it can adapt this, make it more particular to a certain drug. And also it can alter the drug target. You have the drug that targeted the double strand DNA, but it a particular part of the DNA, but the cancer cell member cell itself can mutate that part, make that pathway less important. You target that, but it work, doesn't work. And it, it increases the drug metabolism. So it metabolizes the drug itself inside of the cells. So there are a variety of ways of the cancer cell to survive from chemotherapy. That makes it so difficult to treat them. And now one way to do it is to do combination drug therapy. Instead of using one drug, because cancer has a, a few pathways, let's say two or three pathways, it can reduce one pathway but enhance the other one. But if we can simultaneously put multiple drugs to the same cancer cell and attack it all the different pathway or different cycle of the cells, life cycle of the cells, it may generate a synergistic effect among the different drugs. So the first thing generates a synergistic effect. And it slows the development of drug resistance. It can reduce the treatment failure rate, reduces the case fatality ratio. And also, it can reduce the need to develop a new drug. You may all know, to develop a new anti-cancer drug is very costly. It costs billions of dollars and tens of years to do all the clinical trial. But if you can combine two or more existing drugs and use your synergistic effect, then you can save the cost and save the time to develop new drugs. So this is all the motivation about combination therapy. In fact, in clinic, now we always use combinatorial drug to treat the, to treat the patients. Now, regarding the combination drug therapy, of course, you have two options. The first option is you have different delivery vehicle, and each vehicle has a distinct drug inside, and you, you dose them at the same time. We call it a cocktail, cocktail administration. Okay, so for this cocktail administration, you can see the different nanoparticle has a different circulation half-life different biodistribution. Some of them go to the liver, some of them preferentially go to the spleen. So you cannot control them. It has a varying pharmacokinetics and a varying biodistribution. And also varying membrane transport. Even the get to the cancer cell size, you cannot guarantee all these nanoparticles, different types of nanoparticles will go to the same cancer cell. If they go to the separate cell, it's useless because still a single drug to a single, single cell. And it's a difficult dosing and scheduling optimization and so on. Now, another option is called co-delivery. If you can load this different drug to the same delivery vehicle, two drugs or three drugs to the same delivery vehicle, now you can unify the pharmacokinetics. You can do the ratio-metrical drug loading because you have drug A and B, there is a certain ratio. If you do one to nine, it may not work at all. If you do three to seven, that's the optimal ratio. So you need to control the molar ratio of the drugs inside the particle. And also you can do temporal drug release. You can let one drug coming out to play with the cancer cell to make it dizzy, for example. And then you have a second drug coming out as a burst to burst the release to, to kill the, the cancer cell. Overall, you can control the release rate from the same nanoparticle. But the problem is, uh, the drugs have different physical chemical properties. It's not that easy to let A and B or C go to the same nanoparticle. So uh, quite naughty. Now, how to do this one? So I will tell you, uh, share with the two approaches that we have developed and published already. The first one is for combinatorial treatment of two drugs. Now, if you have two drugs, here we choose paclitaxel and gemcitabine. Both of them are first and second line drugs to treat the pancreatic cancer. But these two drugs, you can clearly see, paclitaxel is water insoluble. 
It's a hydrophobic drug. Gemcitabine is very water soluble. It's not, you, you load them into the nanoparticle, you can see they have completely different hydrophobicity. You cannot load them easily. So our idea is what if we use a hydrolyzable linker to link them together, to make the two entities as one. Now in this way, you, we just use some simple chemical reaction to link these two drugs together. Now you can load them inside the nanoparticle easily. So since this paglitaxel part is larger, so it has more hydrophobic phobicity than this one, so make the overall molecule towards hydrophobic. So you can load them into the polymeric nanoparticle. And you can see after we load these drugs, we synthesize them and then load them into the particle. It's a very uniform nanoparticle. The size is about 80 nanometer. And the hydrodynamic size is consistent with the scanning electron microscope image of the particles. And after you load the drug into the particle, it doesn't really affect the physical chemical properties, surface tension, surface charge, and the size of the particles, and uh, polydispersity, and so on. So now, since this is a hydrolyzable linker, so once you get this drug into the cells, the endothelium, to this uh, uh, endosome, now this drug will be easily hydrolyzed to two drugs original drug, you just break the linkers. Now you got a paclitex or you got a gemcitabine. And then we also showed the drug release curve. So this drug release, you can see at a different pH, the blood pH is about a 7.4, or when you fabricate this particle, it's a neutral pH. At a neutral pH, these linkers are quite stable, quite stable. But once you go to the slight acidic condition, this linker will break quickly. So you can see at even pH 6, the drug will be released quickly, dehydrolyzed quickly, you got the original individual drugs. And this is about the therapeutic efficacy, in vitro therapeutic efficacy, the cytotoxicity to treat the pancreatic cancer cell. You have this free drug, um, paclitaxel and gemcitabine conjugates, and you have this uh, nanoparticle delivery system. You can see for the IC50, so the 50% toxicity, if you load these things into the nanoparticle, it improves the cytotoxicity almost 200 fold, two order of magnitude. So you need almost a micromole to kill the cancer cell. But if you load them into the nanoparticle, you need now sub-10 nanomole. So concentration has significantly improved the system. So this is our initial thought, but it worked for the pancreatic cancer for these two particular drugs, but you can see the problem here. So it's pretty much this drug ratio is a one to one. You cannot control them. If you do one to two, one to three, then we cannot do it. And secondly, is not all the drugs you can do this type of conjugation. So it comes to our approach too. This is a drug polymer conjugation. Instead of conjugating the two drugs together, now we conjugate the drug to the polymer that forms the nanoparticle directly. You have a drug A, you conjugate it to the polymer. You have drug B, you conjugate to the polymer. Since here we have the technique, it's not a simple conjugation. We grow the polymer from the drug. So you have a drug molecule, you grow a polymer chain. Now you can control the polymer chain, make them exactly the same length, and then the same length, the same polymer. So you can imagine that for this system, if you talk about the hydrophobicity or solubility of this system, it's all dominated by this polymer chain because this drug molecule is too small compared to the polymer. So when you mix these two together, it's pretty much similar as you mix the same polymer together. Just each of them carry a different drug at the very end. So in this way now, we can mix the drug A and the drug B together at any ratio you want. You can do one to nine, two to eight, any ratio you want. And you use them with other components, you make this nanoparticle. You can make a nanoparticle. So this, we think, is a very robust technique to, for combinatorial drug delivery. And we also did some proof of concept. So here we choose the drug. One is called Dorsey, Dorsey, uh, Dr. Rubinson. The other one is Campotasin. So both of them are used to treat breast cancer. So this drug, from this polymer, Dr. Rubinson, we do ring opening polymerization to grow a polymer here. And for the Campotasin, we also grow a polymer from the side chain. Now for this, too, if you do the GPC measurement about the molecular weight, you can find the final polymer molecular weight is pretty much the same. It's about a 10 kilodalton. So polymer chain is the same, just at the very end, you have two different drugs there. Now you can mix them. So this one is a, just a dog's PRA alone. This is Campotasin PRA alone. And this is a mixture, half of this uh, A 
dogs, half of the competition, you mix them together, and then you make the nanoparticle. You can see there's nothing really changed in terms of particle size, size distribution, and so on. So you can load them into the particles. Of course, we need to confirm that they are really loaded inside. Then we can break the nanoparticle to quantify exactly how much drug is loaded into each of the nanoparticle. So you can see here, we can vary this dox polymer ratio from one to zero, and all of them will be the dox. Three to one, you can see pretty much this dox is three times more than this campitation. And this is half to half, 50-50, and one to three, and zero to one. We can precisely control the ratio of the two drugs inside the same nanoparticle, and then use them to make the particle. So this is, again, is a co-localization image. Um, you may not see it clearly, but you can see the doxorubicin is a red, gives you a red fluorescence signal. Camptacin gives you a blue fluorescence signal. If two drugs are loaded into the same nanoparticle, when the particles are taken up by the cell, you should see red and blue at the same size, and they overlap with each other. That's exactly what we observed. So this is for the uh, MDB breast, um, MB435 breast cancer cell. And then we also did the toxicity study, in vitro toxicity study. You can see now we can vary the ratio at a different ratio to see uh, is there any uh, difference. And then this uh, blue dash line and this solid line is to compare the co-delivery and the cocktail, cocktail treatment. You find that if we can co-deliver these two drugs to the same cell, it really improved the cytotoxicity as compared to the cocktail treatment. And also, if you room into this particular concentration, about 300 nanomole, then you can see, you can see the difference. So the toxicity difference, um, comparing the co-delivery and this uh, um, cocktail treatment. So overall, the message we want to develop here is we have a very robust method to load multiple drugs into the same nanoparticle, and you can control the ratio, and also you can control the concentration, the overall concentration. And this way, when you get, a, and by the way, for each of these 18 nanometer nanoparticle, we can load currently about 6,000 drug molecules inside. For this 6,000, we can do 1,000 drug A, 5,000 drug B, and also we can control this ratio and how fast they will come out. So it's a robust technique to do that. So I think uh, it's about the time. So I will give a quick conclusion about what I talked. So regarding my, um, besides the overview of nanomedicine, I briefly reviewed the two research direction in my lab. So one is about this uh, RBC membrane camouflaged nanoparticle system. So it translates the membrane surface protein and the protein activities to the synthetic nanoparticle surface. And we think it opens the door to personalize the medicine. When we published this work, it generated a lot of interest because you can imagine that we can collect the blood from the patient himself. Now you use that blood to make a nanoparticle and treat that patient, you will get a zero immunogenicity because mm -hmm. everything is from the patient himself. It's called a personalized medicine. And here we just need a few milliliter blood. It's not a big deal to the patient. And then the second part is called nanoparticle-based combinatorial drug delivery. It can uniformly deliver multiple drugs to the target and demonstrate a superior effect efficacy over cocktail treatment. And finally, I'd like to, of course, thank my research group and all the group members who worked on this project. This work are pretty, done by, pretty much done by uh, graduate student Jack and uh, Ronnie and a postdoc Santos and some financial support, uh, startup funding from Jacob School of Engineering and external funding resource. And many of my great collaborators, especially Professor Joe Wang here is my, one of my greatest collaborator. Thank you for your attention, and happy to ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, great. I really enjoyed the uh, history, um, especially the uh, bacteria developing on along the side of human. Uh -huh. that was um, do we have at least one or two questions? Do we have a little time? Uh huh. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the um, the polymerization mm -hmm. for the um, multiple drugs. Yes. Drugs, and you're able to control the length. I was curious if that was wrapped. Mm -hmm. Using wrap technique for that. 
Mm -hmm. And the second thing was, are you still using a hydrolyzable linker? Um, mm -hmm. Because I was curious about um, if the polymer itself would somehow inhibit mm -hmm. uh, the functionality mm -hmm. uh, of the drug. Okay. So regarding your first question, we used the uh, starting from the hydroxyl group of the drug, and then we do a live ring opening polymerization to attach the um, LA to the surface to form the PLA. And this way you control the monomer concentration, you control the catalyst, catalyst monomer ratio and the reaction time. You can pretty much get the length that you want. Now regarding your second question, here we, we can, either way is fine. We can choose the um, hydrolyzable linker or just use a non-hydrolyzable one because this polymer is hydrolyzable. The backbone of the PRA is lysable. So we think the drug release will be dominated by the erosion of the polymer matrix. That's it. Um, you, you mentioned about uh, you know removing a sample of blood from a patient yes. and then treating it and then reinjecting it. Uh huh. Now, when that's been done with other types of cells, uh, they've always had an immunogenicity. Uh huh. Why is yours uh, different? Mm. Okay, so... And, and, and have you actually demonstrated that? Mm. Okay, so for the immunogenicity, when you inject any kind of external or foreign materials to the body, it can be rejected by the body. It's called immunogenicity, right? So now for this red blood cell membrane, we have two options. One is we can do this, collect the blood directly from the blood bank, and then before we inject back to the patients, we do the blood test to see whether the, the blood type and RH ma matches or not. But the other one, we, we imagine that we can do collect the blood from the patient himself, and we have a way to just collect the red blood cell from the whole blood and use that red blood cell to make this nanoparticle and inject back to that particular patient. Patients. So the patient's immune system will not reject its own blood cells. I, I don't understand why, because that's been done with uh, lots of other cells, and when they're taken from the patient, they mm -hmm. back to the patient, they mm -hmm. are That's uh, If it's alive, for example, now, the live cells, it's all depend on how you treat about these live cells. Like last month, the FDA just approved this uh, facial cell from, for the live cell treatment. These cells are okay. So they collect, do a small surgery from the face, collect the cells and culture them carefully and inject back. Of course, it took 10 years clinical trial, but in August, it was approved in the United States. Yeah. So it all depends on how you treat about these cells. And for us, we just use the cell membrane. When we inject back, it's not the live cell anymore. But we didn't test that yet. It's just the one I ever thought. Yeah. Hmm. Well, excellent. I hope you all will join me in congratulating Professor Zhang and his recent acknowledgement and his research and thanking him for his um, talk. Thank you.